Can you guys hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Great. Um, so are there any questions uh, for, the, for the most recent talks? I think there was one uh, we wanted to cover at the end about in, imperfect charge gate. Was that addressed? I, I'm not able to pronounce the name I see on the screen for that one. Sorry. That was from Feigelman. So if he, uh, but he's muted. If he wants to ask, why doesn't he un unmute? Misha. Uh, well, I already got an answer to my question from uh, Konstantin. So that's okay. Okay, I can get through the chat right now. So if you have questions, please ask. Yeah, any, any more questions uh, for Constantine or uh, for oh, David? I add one for, uh, for uh, Constantine. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So when you have the parallel um, like SETs kind of, uh, if, if one were to just, uh, let's say, like drive all of them randomly, like if you just drive them with uncorrelated noise, mm -hmm. uh, would you then get protection, uh, or like what? What would it look like, both in terms of, I guess, like the T1 and T2 protection? Would you, would you? Uh, so I, uh, I like to think about this in terms of this dispersion surface, right? And again, uh, we know that if our derivative is zero along this and that direction, the derivative, the first derivative along the diagonal. So when we have simultaneous, you know, change in. Uh, ng1 and ng2 is zero, right? We have only second order mm, sensitivity to this type of process, right? Uh, but yeah, of course, we get uh, the dipole moment, I guess, uh, in this case, because our states uh, uh, are not orthogonal anymore. Oh, I didn't present. Okay. Can you, can you see the picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can I can see that. I guess I was wondering, like, you know, if you go to higher dimensions, right? So you're at a very high dimension. You'll say you had twenty of them or something like that. But then mm -hmm. you, but now you're just you've you've literally just biased it randomly. Then mm -hmm. is does that end up looking? I guess there's a question of whether it looks flat in frequency, and there's another question whether the matrix element is still small. And it, it seems plausible. Mm -hmm. that be okay, but it's not obvious. Yeah, I guess it depends on the amplitude of your random noises. Uh, I think that uh, dispersion would be more flat than in, in case of uh, single or two uh, ion devices. And yes, you'll get the matrix uh, element, non-zero matrix element uh, in this case. Because you're again, your states are not orth orthogonal anymore. Uh, David, I can explain maybe. Uh, look, what happens here that is this device is exactly dual to uh, to the charge pairing device. So mm -hmm. if you want to have just a prote minimal protection, the what the picture that unfortunately is no longer on the screen but was there a second ago is sufficient. However, if you, but it's equivalent, uh, so, but in this picture, you will have, uh, in this circuit, you will just have no spreading of the wave function over different parities, as Michelle was showing or Robert was showing. So in order to have the wave function, which is sufficient, significantly spread over many states with the same parity, you need that the, fl uh, the double flux, when it enters the loop, um, enters relatively easily. So you need that there is a large amplitude for the double flux to get in. And if you do really the circuit, which is was shown here before, which is you have just a few switches uh, in parallel, you will not achieve it because you will kill not only the single flux tunneling in, but double flux killing uh, tunneling in itself. In contrast, so if you see my board, uh, do you see my board behind me? Yeah, you should see my board behind me. So, uh, yeah, see. Uh, so, 
let me just quickly draw the equivalent picture. So the charge pairing device is something like that. And here you have a large capacitance. This device that they have is like that and uh, like that. And so, and here you have a, a loop which is equivalent to, to a large capacitance. So what you, what you have here in this device, that double Cooper pair tunnels from this side to this side to that side, and the energy on each intermediate side is relatively low. So this double Cooper, Cooper pair pairing, tunneling is efficient. Similarly, you want the double flux uh, to find out tunnels efficiently here and then here. But to, to achieve that, what you need uh, to include here inductor. So the energy that uh, you lose when the double flux get in is not too large. Mm -hmm. And then you get the same spreading of the wave function only in the, uh, in the terms of the uh, even an odd number of fluxes as we have, as one should have here in your device, uh, zero pi device, or um, in uh, the device with Cooper chair, Cooper pair uh, pairing, whatever uh, that Robert was talking about, or with photons that Michel was talking about. If you do this with the inductance, mm -hmm. if you don't do that, then the energy when to, you get two fluxes here is prohibitive. You will not have any tunneling and no spreading of the wave function. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, Lev. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions on this topic? Okay, uh, just a quick thing. So we're going to have a, a comment from Andre, and then we have two outstanding questions for Robert McDermott we didn't get to that I'll, I'll introduce. And then we will have time for an open discussion, about 40 minutes. So please uh, think about questions you have, um, discussion topics, uh, put them into the chat and I'll help to uh, to moderate that. But why don't we go, if we can, to Andre, who had a comment about Actually, uh, Yen, Jens is actually here, uh, and he had a quick five-minute presentation to give. Would it be possible if you could give that first? Um, Alan, we could. I was going to cover the quick questions that were outstanding and have time then time for the topic. So what's up to Jens? Jens, do you have any time commitment that you need? you would like to present right now? I can wait. OK, just because I think we have some outstanding questions, I just wanted to wrap those up, if that's OK, Alan. Perfect. Great. So Andre, are you available? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so there was this uh, kind of discussion in the chat right, between John Martinez, Alexei Kitaev, and Yu Chen. Uh, so I just happened to have like exactly a couple slides about that. Great, yeah, really yeah, you can present. Yeah, yeah, to this, uh, to this question. Um, do, do you see my screen? No. No. Uh, Should be a okay. Yeah. Present, present How about that? Okay. There it goes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically, the question was about what's the like what was the difference between uh, RF squid-like devices and this uh, imperfect zero pi. And the thing is that in in, in the squid-like devices, you have this quadratic component, which basically means that your wave function lives on some kind of on on a line. The domain of the wave function is the line. But in the case of a zero pi, it's different topology. So the wave function lives on the circle because you have the periodicity. Uh, now, the thing is, well, this is pretty trivial. But then when you start concatenating many of them, then the, if you have, let's say, two zero pi elements, then the total space where the wave fun function lives is the product space of the two circle, which is a two torus two-dimensional torus. Now, when we concatenate uh, plaquettes in the particular way, we create a certain capacitance matrix, which facilitates uh, tunneling between these states, you know, zero, zero, pi, pi, and so on, in a particular way, which couples, let's say, zero, zero to pi, pi, 
uh, pi zero to zero pi and so on. So it's it's a certain braiding, but it's a braiding inside this multidimensional torus manifold because here you can see on the square you you can basically glue the top of the square to the bottom of the square and left of the square to the right of the square. That's what uh, Alexei Kitaevs was saying about that you can uh, in in a plaquette or in this imperfect zero pi you can move to the left and to the right, but in the in case of uh, Flexonium-like devices, you cannot do that. You're limited by the square potential. And what you eventually have when you concatenate many plaquettes is you have that due to this tunneling, which is organized by the this capacitance matrix, you have certain braiding of the states. So first you have, um, if you have just one plaquette, then your topology is a circle and you have only zero and pi states. If you have two, uh, two zero pi elements, then you work in the basis of like zero, zero, pi, pi, zero, pi, and pi, zero, and due to capacitance matrix, they get entangled in this more complicated way due to tunneling because of capacitance matrix shape. And uh, basically this entangling happens on the surface of a torus. And uh, that's the topological property of a torus that on a torus you can basically make draw two circles which are interlinked, but uh, do not intersect with each other, which you cannot do on a plane, which you would get in case of RF squid like devices. And just for example, uh, you get this kind of like complicated braiding in case of three plaquettes, it would look like this. And this kind of weird figure would live inside a three-dimensional torus. So j just as before was mentioned by many people, by Michel Devoray and Robert McDermott, that you, for protection, you need to be first delocalized and second, your wave functions have to be intertwined. Zero and one wave functions have to be intertwined. And in this case, they basically get delocalized in this multidimensional torus manifold and they also get inter intertwined in it. Yeah, that's basically what I want to say. That's basically this, the main kind of topological difference between zero, zero pi element and RF squid. Hope that makes sense. Uh, it's John. Thank you very much. That was helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. If there are no other uh, questions or comments, then uh, Michelle Devere had had a question for Lev. Michelle, could you introduce your question? Yes. Um, um, yes. So, um, so Lev. Uh, so I see that. Uh, so I am continuing with this theme of uh, yes. wave functions that are delocalized and uh, intertwined. But uh, so Lev mentioned that uh, there, there was um, basically GKP was two photons. What uh, zero pi qubits was to Cooper pair and I'd like to understand this better because it seems to me more property of the cat states. I would have uh, thought that cat states are delocalized in photon numbers and intertwined uh, but uh, but not but GKP seems to be uh, something different that uh, is uh, because you have a delocalization both in uh, in Q and in uh, in yeah. P. So, so maybe Lev could explain uh, the. Yes, the analogy. just a second. Uh, so I will use the same board and even, <laughs> and even the same picture, uh, so that uh, so here in this uh, this device we have of course the states which uh, differ by the charge which uh, takes uh, either. Um, uh, odd or even numbers. So the wave function in this representation is just uh, what you drew here before. Uh, and it's either, uh, either odd or even. However, so it, it doesn't look at the moment exactly what uh, you have for photons. However, in engine, and that's actually what you need to do to do the fault tolerant operations, yet you add a large uh, inductor here. Of course, everything is connected. So then, 
what happens that the charge is no longer an integer number you have so what does it mean when the inductor is very large when the inductor is very large it means that each of these peaks becomes broad uh, because the charge is not integer anymore and what you get and you, you see that what you start to get is a wave function which is a delocola which is uh, uh, the inter so on one hand intertwined as in photons and it goes over integer and even numbers and it's because now and you see now that it's exactly the same as your picture um yes but uh, you you're not um you're not superposing a uh, block uh, state no? No, it, well, it depends now, it depends where you can take a Fourier transform of it. And in the Fourier transform, you will have exactly the same in the, in the in the, so that's the picture in the charge. Now you take a Fourier transform in the face and it will be the same in the face. Mm -hmm. This The whole thing becomes exactly symmetric as in your, as in what you mm -hmm. present. Yes, but uh, it it would still be um, a, a superposition of different quadratures of uh, squeezed uh, squeezed quadratures. Not. Uh, no, but if the wave function, if you agree that the wave functions are identical, that means that and the systems are the same. So I mean that the uh, of course uh, the way how we control it is different because the physics is different. When one case it's a number of Cooper pairs, in other case it's a number of photons. So the way how we Im implement it is completely different, but the end result is the same. Uh, no, but uh, I, uh, I, I think a displacement along the coordinates uh, Q or P, uh, which in this case, in the case of uh, zero pi it, uh, is the charge, the Q is the charge, uh, this is uh, not a, a equivalent to a displacement in photon number. So when you displace in photon number, you add a photon at each step. But uh, adding uh, adding uh, a displacement along the quadrature is not the same thing. It's it's a uh, it's Cartesian versus um, uh, radial coordinates. Well, yes, you need to do this transformation, which is uh, rotation by. Um, no, no, no it's, not, uh, it's not rotation. It's uh, it's only rota It's not a transformation by rotation. It's the photon number length uh, is uh, is the square of the quadrature length. So <clears throat> so photon numbers uh, in phase space goes like the square of the radius. Yes, and the same I can tell you about this. Yeah, this coordinate Q. Um, so it's it's a charge number, or it could be a yeah. flux number. Yes. But that in an oscillator is equivalent to a quadrature, to so to an amplitude of oscillation, not to the energy, which is the square of the oscillation amplitude. So you see my point. So when you superpose photon numbers, you you superpose um, energies which go in, uh, in integer steps. But yes. if you go in integer steps in energy, you don't go in integer steps in amplitude, because amplitude... Yes, you get, yeah, you get square roots. So, yeah. so yeah. no, what you tell me is that... The, no, I, I think I, I understand. For me, the square root is the essential difference between uh, cat states, which are superposite, or even or odd superpositions of, uh, of photon numbers, and the uh, GKP, which are superpositions of uh, quadrature. No, but what you tell me is that the wave function is the same. It's just that the way you got it is completely different because your Hamiltonian is completely different because Hamiltonian, in your case, contains no, 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 the number no. of photons. No, no, I think that uh, even... Uh, no, I think the, 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 uh, the states are um, fundamentally different. Because this is what, well, Alexei is somewhere here, so he can uh, probably yeah, comment on like whether it, this it, is it, exactly it, KKP or not. Yeah, so well, I would be interested to know the opinion of Alexei. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I think the state is the same as uh, if it's connected uh, 
to an inductor is left shared. Uh, so a left shared an oscillator, uh, and uh, the state is created by using the zero pi qubit uh, and an inductor, a large inductor. So I, I think the state is the same, but uh, the physics is different, of course, because what uh, you did is implementing uh, the state in an oscillator that uh, const uh, is constantly moving. Oh no, but uh, no, 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 no. I am not. Uh, maybe there's a misunderstanding. I'm. I'm just saying that these uh, GKP states are not uh, superpositions of uh, Fox states uh, with uh, increasing uh, photon numbers. Oh no, certainly not. Certainly not. That, that's I simply. Know. What, um, I was. Um, I was saying that uh, the superpositions of uh, uh, of uh, Fox states with increasing. Uh, Photon numbers uh, are cat states. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. But I, I thought Lev was showing a picture in, in the quadrature space. Uh, yes, of course. Was, so it's not uh, in the photon number. Yes, yes, no, no, but um, so I, I agree. No, so what, yeah, so I think I agree with Michel that his state, if you if you view it in the space of photon numbers, is not uh, is not this. It is yes. in the state of Q in the state of uh, relative amplitudes of photons that it should be like yes. that. Yes, yes, it's the amplitude of photon, the, the photon amplitude, but not the photon number. Yes, I agree. I agree. So if you want, um, I'm. I'm Q is cannot is not n uh, here. Uh, what yes, you yes, yes. The mother yeah. is it. yeah. With that, I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. So we we everyone but agrees. That. I wanted to give Benoit a chance. Benoit had had a question. So Benoit, if you could unmute yourself. Um, he had written. Okay. And while you're still uh, muted, uh, the questions relating GKP versus zero pi. Are you able? To... And why are you able to to unmute? Okay, looks like he's going to rejoin. <laughs> um, uh, Vlad, I believe Vladimir had a question for for Michelle on the same topic. Vladimir, are you available? Uh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I have a qu question to Michelle. Um, uh, so, so uh, Michelle, you, you mentioned um, during your presentation that um, Ancilla qubit doesn't need to have um, uh, a good error property in both directions it's enough uh, to have um, uh, to have only um, um, good uh, coherence in one um, in one channel uh, so there's a small error rate in one channel um, and I was wondering that that would mean that Ancilla is a classical uh, is just a classical bit so there must be some requirement to the error rate in the other channel I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on this um, i find it interesting um yes uh yes uh, this is uh, this is an interesting uh, uh very interesting point uh, you you for nancilla um uh, you need uh, two states uh, say that um have, would have for instance the same energy and then uh, you uh, you would measure the, the which state you are in and uh, if uh, they have exactly the same energy, then there won't be any back action. So even if uh, you have um, a poor qubit and you have transitions from one uh, um, uh, ground state to the other degenerate ground state, then you, you will have a visibility, you will have uh, less than one fidelity. So each time you have a measurement, you have uh, less than one bit. But the important thing is that uh, you won't corrupt uh, 
uh, what you're trying to stabilize. You see, in fact, uh, the, the most important error in this JKP stabilization is the backpropagation of errors from the ancilla to the, uh, the cavity. This is really where um, quantum error correction differ the most from uh, classical uh, error correction. In classical error, um, th there's not um, this problem of backpropagation of uh, the imperfection of the measurement. And classically, the only price you pay with a bad measurement is that it takes you longer to figure out uh, what um, uh, um, action should you take, um, how how you should uh, feedback the system. But quantum mechanically, there is this perverse effect of uh, measurement back action. And so this is why it's nice to have an ancilla, which is, as you say, a, a classical bit. A classical bit still in the sense that, for instance, it's two energies have to be the same. So for instance, an SRAM um, type of memory is good, but if you would uh, have a sort of classical qubit uh, implemented by two different levels, it would not be good. Okay. So in that sense, the cat, uh, the, the, the cat qubit is really nice because it, is, uh, it has the same speed as more or less a sort of uh, transmond, but uh, it has two degenerate states. So the having two, two, two degenerate states is very desirable for ancillas. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So, Benoit, uh, if you can unmute, uh, please ask your question, or else I saw you wrote it here too. So, um, I believe it's for. Is it for Michelle? Yes, Michelle. If you're able to read the chat, um, Benoit's put his questions in there. He's having trouble unmuting. No problem, Benoit. Um, I'm happy to read it. So the question is as follows. Given the fact that photon number and phase are canonically uh, conjugate variables, can we try to make grid states in these variables instead of the quadratures? One needs to implement phase transitions, which is pretty easy, and photon number transitions. So yeah, Michelle, that's the, those are the questions or comments. You're muted, uh, Michelle. You're, you're still muted. There. Okay. Yes. Um, so the so sorry. The um, I am reading the question, but I am not uh, understanding it uh, really well. Can you? What What do you think the question is? Uh, I think it's, can you, um, can you change the variables to yeah, so Yes, yeah, so in here, uh, Benoit wants to say that, look, what we need for this picture, Q and P, uh, that, uh, that we make the wave function, which is intertwined, why don't we use instead of Q and P, phase and um, amplitude, and phase and the photon number? Because what we need, he says, is two conjugate variables. So here we are both yes, using yes, Q and yes. P. Yes, but uh, yeah, conjugate variables, but yeah, <laughs> but phi and n are not uh, good conjugate variables. Uh, they are singular. Uh, uh, they are not. Um, they are only conjugate variable away from zero, um, close to zero. There's a singularity in this kind of uh, conjugate variables. So polar coordinates are not. Um, you know, if the commutator of uh, theta and n is not uh, is not I, um, it uh, this is a singular. Um, um, these are singular variables uh, right uh, <clears throat> at the origin. So you cannot use uh, phase and n, or if you want n as this really annoying uh, um, property that it is the square of a quadrature. Anyway, um, it, uh, there's also some practical, um, uh, practical consideration. It is very easy to displace an oscillator. It is much um, harder to manipulate the, the, uh, the, 
uh, the, the uh, for, for instance, if you want to go, if you take an oscillator and you go, for, you have, uh, you can prepare the ground state, but then uh, um, it's uh, difficult to go directly to the one state or to the two state or to the three state, uh, the fog state. It's uh, much easier to, to displace uh, the oscillator. You cannot implement uh, A or A dagger just like that. Uh, you, it's you. You cannot. Uh, you can uh, implement A plus A dagger uh, or A minus A dagger. But uh, these operators that uh, le let you go through um, uh, the ladder of fog states are not so easy to implement. So that's also um, this is also a, a peculiarity. So, uh, you can say it probably differently, Michel, that you want the wave function in this space to be smooth and because of this singularity, as you said, it will always introduce some, um, uh, some uh, singularity at zero and mm. that will uh, immediately mean that you have uh, errors. Yes. So, maybe an important difference I would like to point out is that, uh, yes, uh, our Q and uh, P are like the charge and the phaser, but um, they um, they also um, they can be um, dynamic coordinates. So they are not static. Uh, they are not static amplitude. So you you can work in a rotating frame uh, away from uh, one over f noise. So this is uh, really also an advantage. So. We are, our GKP states uh, lives in a rotating frame, so it samples. Uh, so all the static uh, influences on the resonator are, are ironed out. It's uh, it's rotating. Uh, the state is rotating at six gigahertz. So that's an advantage uh, with um, respect to uh, devices where the uh, Q and P would be like um, absolute charge or absolute flux. Well, thank you. I think unless there are other questions on the same topic, I see there's a little bit of discussion with um, with Arnie and, and Benoit in the chat, which is great. So, um, but I'd like to go to Jens. I think Jens has been very patient. Jens, would you be able to give your presentation now? Yeah, I'll try sharing my screen right now. Um, thank you. Let's see. Uh, and it says, where is it? Sorry, it's, uh, I've been using Zoom for many days now, and this is uh, slightly different than that. Um, okay, presenter view, show, slideshow. Okay, that looks good. Are you able to see the screen now? Yes, it's coming through. Okay, excellent. Great. Yeah, so so you've um, you've pretty much heard about research that I've been doing in my group through Dave Schuster, David Ferguson, and Andrew Haupt. Um, but there's there's one item I'd, I'd like to advertise a little bit independently, which is uh, this this open source Python package for superconducting qubits that Peter Groszkowski and myself have developed and that is now available to the community. And it does include some of the uh, protected superconducting qubits. So I'll say just a few words about the, the functionality um, because I, I think it has the potential to be a, a useful resource, um, particularly for, for incoming graduate students so that they can immediately uh, use this uh, and, and get jump started in their research. Um, and so to, to enable that, we've, uh, we've actually worked uh, quite a bit on, uh, it's not forwarding, let's see. We've worked uh, quite a bit on, uh, documentation. So there's a lot of documentation uh, immediately available online uh, about how to install it, uh, what's in the library, how to use it. Um, and just to uh, give you a, a flavor of, um, you, you know, what are some of the simplest things that you can do, right? You can just uh, uh, load up the, the library in a, in a Jupyter notebook. Um, there it is. And then you can create a fluxonium uh, uh, Qubit, uh, it, it brings up a little uh, graphical user interface so you know about the parameters it's expecting. And uh, then getting eigenvalues, of course, is, is really easy. Um, you can, uh, uh, let's see, 
you can easily uh, make uh, parameter sweeps here, for instance, versus flux. So, so you'll get uh, a couple of, of eigenvalues versus flux. Uh, and you can plot a selection of wave functions as well. So those are, those are some of the, the simplest things that you can do. Um, it goes a little bit further. So um, as I said, there's, uh, there's a couple uh, qubits currently in there where we'd be excited to, to add some more. In, in fact, uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle's uh, protected qubit uh, with uh, you know, the, the paper by Smith et al. Um, is, is on our list for sure. Um, and so you can you can uh, compute and visualize uh, all the regular things, energies, wave functions. You can plot matrix elements. You can do parameter sweeps. And uh, what what makes it quite nice and, and and flexible is that you can then also couple qubits and oscillators and and get to composite Hilbert spaces. Um, there's uh, some more uh, graphical user interface stuff that allows you to work with sliders and and see how things change as a function of parameters. And all of that has a Q-tip interface so that uh, you, you can generate your Hamiltonian. And if you're interested in simulating time dependence and uh, this master equation potentially, then that's, of course, the strength of Q-tip. And uh, that ties directly in, in there. Um, and uh, in, the, in the next release, which I hope will be uh, coming out in the next uh, 10 days, uh, there will be a new uh, component to the library that allows you to make predictions of, of coherence times. And so it's, uh, it's really easy to, uh, to access. Uh, you can install it through, through Conda or, or PIP. And um, uh, that, that's really all I had. I, <clears throat> I think it, it could be a, a nice tool. And I thought I would, I would just share this with everybody. Thank you, Jens. Any questions? For Jens? Is this project available for outside contributions? Absolutely. Where is it? Uh, so it's, if, if you just Google for SE qubits and GitHub, um, you'll find it immediately. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Jens. This is very impressive. Very nice. Um, is that possible we can do self-defined circuit with just a few components? Uh, you, you're asking, could you just sort of uh, draw a new circuit and, and get uh, the Hamiltonian from that and then uh, get all the diagonalization? So I, I, this is something we've been thinking about. There are actually other packages out there that uh, do something in, in that direction. Um, I think Q, is it called QCAT um, is, is one of them. Um, but it's sort of limited to, to the nearly harmonic uh, regime. Um, I think something that is completely general purpose and, and you know, you, you define a five node, six node, seven node circuit and it figures out everything by itself, that's still a little bit uh, beyond what, uh, what, what we're able to do. Um, but if, uh, if people out there have, have ideas and want to contribute, that would be really exciting. Thanks. That's very cool. Uh, this is a question. Uh I just have a question. Would that be connected, be able to connect to some packages like QuizKit or Circ? Like, is there a way to underline, simulate some smaller algorithms with it? Um, in, well, yes, perhaps. So, so I, I think that, that I would definitely try to do on, on the Q-tip side, right? Because um, so, so what, what this package aims to do is to uh, find eigenstates, eigenenergies, all the relevant matrix elements. But uh, w once you say you want to perform gates, right, then, then we're talking about uh, time evolution, feeding in pulses, and that is really where Q-tip shines. So, so what you can do with, with this SE qubits package is you, you'll do all the nitty gritty stuff that defines your qubits and characteristics of that. And then that gets exported to Q-tip and um, you know, master equation simulation, in, including microwave pulses on the Q-tip side is, is great. Thank you. Thanks. And I, I put the GitHub link in the chat so people can easily find it. Thank you, Jens, and thanks to all our presenters today. Um, really good discussion. We have a couple outstanding questions for Robert McDermott. So, um, uh, John Martinez, are you available? Uh, my, I already asked my question, uh, so I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. And then Orion um, from the Google team, did you still have a question for Robert? Yeah. Just a second. Let me pull that back up.
It's about the okay. concatenation of imperfect plaquettes. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is hi Robert. This is Orion. Uh, regarding the concatenating imperfect plaquettes, uh, my intuition is that when fabricating a device, uh, if you're concatenating several elements, then you're going to be introducing the error of fabricating each element for each of those copies. Uh, is this, and that would then then increase the overall fabrication error or reduce the overall quality of the, of the qubit. Uh, is this a concern at the number of plaquettes that are required for this device? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I see what you're getting at. And I, I think the answer is no. I mean, it's not like we're uh, in a situation where we get some kind of uh, exponential suppression in the overall fidelity as we go to some large number of devices. I mean, the way that you might, you know, if you're doing some fixed frequency qubits and you need to go to a very large array, you're you're inevitably going to end up with some frequency clashes uh, as you go to more and more elements. I mean, here, uh, the concerns are uh, deviation from frustration due to flux noise or, um, uh, you know, also some slight uh, asymmetries within the single plaquettes. And, um, you know, as long as we can fabricate devices with uh, E1 over E2 kind of at the few percent level, uh, I mean, it's not like we, we require some hero devices to do that. And the number of plaquettes that we are talking about concatenating is three or at most four in order to get good performance according to the simulations that uh, Lev and Laura and Andre have done. So, you know, I think, um, I think that uh, uh, we, uh, I, I don't think fabrication uh, uh, and yield is gonna be an issue as we go to this rather small number of plaquettes in order to try to access the, the protected regime. Thanks. It looked like there was a, another question that it popped up and then disappeared. I, I don't know if that was for me. Uh, Lev, Lev was suggested Alexei may have a comment. Yeah, on. So I can tell his comment and his answers at the same time. If he, uh, so uh, Alexei wanted to comment on these on this, um, chains of um, uh, plaquettes that they have um, intrinsic uh, uh, weak points that when the charge in the intermediate island is exactly E, uh, the uh, single Cooper pair tunneling is allowed. And so in principle, there is always a possibility of error if you know, even if you have a long chain of plaquettes, if all uh, charges are exactly E at each point, then the Cooper pair tunneling is allowed through the whole chain and therefore the protection is lost. So one should always keep the charge away from this point. So, uh, yeah, so that's definitely true. Uh, yeah, I, I should add uh, uh, that uh, the sign of the charge at uh, this intermediate island should be known. Otherwise, we cannot implement gates. We'll be implementing some gates, but uh, we'll not know which one. So we need to know the charges on, on the intermediate islands because the wave function depends on those charges. Yeah, so we need to keep these charges from fluctuating too much. In other words, every, I don't know how many minutes, uh, we have to check how they moved. So if we ever get to this stage, um, it means that every uh, 10 minutes we should move the, uh, the state from one, uh, from one uh, protected device to another, check if the charge has moved far away, and then move the, st move the state back. Thank you. We have, uh, Ilya had a question. Ilya, are you available to ask? Yeah, uh, so uh, the nice thing about the zero pi cube is, uh, from what I understand, is not the high coherence time, but the fact that you can make these protected gates. And the protected gates, you need these switches, and the switches might be difficult because with a squid, well, a perfect squid is a nice thing, but it's kind of difficult to make a perfect uh, on-off switch and scalable. So what's actually the requirement for the on-off ratio of these squids? How, how good should they be? Is there any ideas about that? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, Lev, maybe you can address this. I mean, you've gone through these uh, simulations uh, of gate fidelities for realistic uh, parameters for the squid switch. Sorry, I, my problem was that I didn't understand the question because of a poor connection. Uh, so can you re repeat? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, the squid switch, uh, it's very difficult to make a real on-off thing. Uh, of course. Because... And uh, the question is, how good should it be? And if it's not very good, what do we? Get? What happens? Ah, yeah, yeah. So, well, basically, what we assume is that the squi uh, for the for the squid switch, uh, we have a variation by a factor of effective Johnson energy variation by a factor of ten. I think it's sufficient to uh, completely sufficient to operate the to do the gates. So, in other words, 10%. Okay, that, that sounds reasonable. Okay. <laughs> yeah, quite generous. That's good. Any other questions? Uh, now we're moving into our open Q&A, open discussion. Uh, questions, big ideas, concerns? Um, and then we'll wrap up. Alan Ho will give a little bit of a summary of our academic engagement work that helps benefits many of you, the universities, and then we'll have a closing statement at the end. But I guess now's the chance to open the, the mic. Um, you can put it in the chat. You can speak up, um, propose a topic or a question. No, it's of course difficult. Uh, so this is Alan. Um, I just have a kind of a, a bit of an open-ended question, which is um, I see a lot of the presentations around Fluxonium as well as the zero pi qubits uh, discussing how they improve like the T1 or T2 times. Uh, but um, a lot of people who are building algorithms, they care more about system performance benchmarks like uh, the two qubit error rates or the Brito error rates. Um, and, uh, you know, as we, in, as a, in, from an engineering standpoint, when you introduce more and more of these systems, uh, like inductors, it's harder to couple the qubits, it's harder to control the qubits in some sense as well. So I'm just wondering if there's kind of like interim experiments or different types of in experiments that these qubits will ultimately improve system performance benchmarks like two qubit error rates. Uh, beyond the T1 and T2 uh, benchmarks. Robert, maybe you comment because you were talking about it in, in your talk. Uh, sorry, how will this... Uh... Just on the, on the full tolerant operations. Uh, so how will this improve two qubit error rates? Uh, well, I mean, okay, I mean, I, I think it's critical to have a, a device that does provide access to fault tolerant Cliffords. I mean, certainly for our uh, work, we're uh, not, not anywhere near the point where we're going to be thinking about doing uh, entangling gates involving the switchable superinductor. But uh, I mean, in principle, there is a, a path uh, to do this. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what's critical is not just uh, improving coherence of a single qubit, but you need to have uh, a path to doing global optimization of a very complex system of interacting qubits. And um, so, you know, I think uh, regardless of your approach to improving uh, device performance, you need to uh, be able to you know, preserve the ability to interact these qubits and to uh, build up a large scale, uh, you know, system of interacting qubits. Otherwise, um, you know, it might be interesting work from the physics standpoint, but uh, at the end of the day, we want to build a, a fault tolerant quantum computer. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, to demonstrate first fault tolerant operations for a, a single qubit, that's going to be a critical milestone. And then uh, demonstrate and, you know, characterize using some technique like randomized benchmarking uh, fault tolerant uh, entangling gates, that would be a, a huge step forward. 
but maybe my question is, is there like, is there some sort of like metric that tell you that you still are able to interact with the qubits uh, easily? Like, is there some sort of metric that uh, like that you can do? Hi, it's John Martinez. Uh, maybe I can, I can answer that. Um, you know, besides people um, quoting T1 and T2, which people have been doing, you should also be quoting the gate time. And again, people have done that uh, uh, throughout the, the two days, and I think that's been useful for me. I think what's tricky here is a lot of times when you're devising protected qubits, uh, when you go to do a gate, you're overlapping the wave functions and T1 and T2 can then change. So it's clear, again, again this could be some complicated way that that could they be doing. So, you know, we understand that, but people should be quoting T1 and T2 in the gate times and then also what happens to T1 and T2 during the gates. And, uh, you know, that by having those numbers explicitly understood, then we could make a kind of a system level performance. And of course, there'll be more things than that, but those are kind of the simple minded concepts that have to be discussed. Yeah, I would agree with that, John. This is Andrew. Uh, I would just echo that you know, right now we focus a lot on T1 and T2 because it's clear that the coherence limit to gate fidelity and all of these novel qubits. Uh, at the moment are sort of not going to be any significant improvement over transmon. So I think uh, while we're still in the limit where we're, we're clearly uh, coherence limited in terms of gate fidelities, like uh, that number captures everything. Once we get past the point where we can get protected qubit coherence, where we would expect an improvement, then I think doing these sort of system level sort of randomized benchmarking plus uh you know process fidelity and all of this kind of stuff becomes important well and i mean i also say john that uh, you mentioned that uh when you interact qubits uh you have to take the devices out of protection but with an ideal you know uh, theoretically perfect zero pi element you 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 don't need to do that you don't need to uh go out of protection in order to do um fault tolerant X, Z, and entangling gates. You know, w we need to figure out how to make the thing, but in principle, uh, you can do everything except for the one unprotected non-Clifford operation that you need uh, to do universal quantum computing. So I think that's the, the power of this idea. In principle, if we can figure out how to make it, we can do everything in a, in a completely protected way. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Robert. Uh, let's talk offline so I can understand that better. That's a great point. I'd like to intervene. Uh, this is Michel de Vore. Um, so uh, I think uh, maybe the correct metric, if I would, uh, I would try to um, uh, say something that uh, bridges be between the, the software uh, and the hardware, I think it's the fidelity of the logical uh, qubits. I mean, once you have uh, logical qubits, you can, uh, within a, a certain clock time, you, you can uh, define uh, the fidelity of the various operations. I think this is what we have to globally optimize. So un until you have uh, logical qubits, which can have uh, gates between them, um, you know, it, it, because the optimization has uh, not to be on one uh, particular parameter, but uh, it has to be the, the system optimization, the, the system consisting of, uh, let's say, two logical qubits that uh, do gates uh, between them. So, so, so shall so I? We are at the stage where we can say exactly how these uh, logical qubits would. Uh, would would function although i i think uh, gkp as a in my opinion as a bright future but so so i uh, i agree with that i'm i'm just trying to um propose some metrics to do as a bridge between the present let's say t1 and t2 metrics and doing uh you know logic logical qubits or qubit uh qubit uh, error rates uh, uh, I think the you know it, it a, there's a lot of intermediate research that has to be done. Uh, understanding those numbers along the way are going to be good. 
But in the end, it's the logical rates. And then if you want to get more complex, you have to run qubits simultaneously, run algorithms. It just gets, you know, into this big, you know, long thing that you have to do, of course. Also, it's Vadim, um, when we talk about the gate fidelity, it's a little bit concept that is not always helpful. For example, if I have leakage, right? So the concept of the uh, randomized benchmarker or cross center benchmarking, uh, you have to really be careful because when you go outside of computational subspace and then you go back into computational subspace or you have a crosstalk, for example, right? So those things are not easy to characterize uh, through the gate fidelities. And I feel that's also, that's why logically, right? We have to figure out the way how to easily study that in terms of the changing of the physical errors of individual qubits. I think that's important. Maybe through the polarizing channel model or something like that. Yes, uh, so maybe um, <laughs> to, to reinforce what Vadim uh, is saying, even at the level of a single uh, logical qubit, you have the lifetime of four operators. You have the X, the Y, and the Z operator. But in addition, you have the I operator, which is this out of space uh, um, decay, which doesn't exist for physical qubits. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I've been mindful of time. I I think if we could, it'd be great to go on to Alan's short presentation and then the closing statements, if that's okay. Um, so thank you to all the speakers and to the great discussion and questions. Please continue. I know there'll be a lot of follow-up conversations. And I think our team would envision helping to kind of host these types of workshops more frequently, certainly not every, every waiting 12 months. So um, thank you everyone and I'll pass it over to Alan. You're, you're muted, Alan. Thanks, Alan. You're still on mute, Alan, so if you could unmute. So are you able to see uh, the screen? Yep. OK. So uh, I just want to give you a quick uh, uh, preview of how we engage with academia, um, just to give you a little bit of understanding of who we are. Um, so in our team, we have four product and program managers. These are uh, uh, team members that are helping out with a lot of our external collaborations. Um, the things that we're interested in is better hardware, better algorithms, and uh, first applications. Uh, things that uh, you can that uh, academics can work with us is to access hardware. Uh, we have internships, both hardware and software internships uh, in our group. Um, here's a couple of the interns who are from our theory team. Uh, we also have PhD fellows. So every year uh, we nominate uh, several um, uh, we nominate several students to become PhD fellows and we pay for their uh, PhDs. Uh, Amy Green from Will Oliver's group is uh, specifically in hardware, and we'd love to find uh, sponsor more P Google PhD fellows. Uh, we also have visiting faculty and postdocs. So these are uh, two visiting faculty and uh, postdocs from uh, the year before. Um, we actually have a few other uh, hardware visiting faculty and postdocs as well in this coming year. We have a yearly uh, conference where we bring together a lot of, of our theory team, but also some hardware folks as well. And we have two types of academic funding. One is a two to three year type funding. Um, you know, just one or more graduate students um, and gives you access to researchers and hardware. And then we have smaller one year fundings as well um, and gives you access to our researchers as well as hardware. Uh, but one example that I want to kind of uh, share with you is uh, how we work with our uh, collaborators, especially on uh, hardware. So this is a Boulder uh, cryogenic resonator test bed. And one of the issues, as we all know, is how do we improve materials? Um, and you can, only, you can only improve materials if you have a, a consistent way to measure specifically single photon loss for these materials. 
So Josh Mutis is working uh, with Dave Pappas from Boulder. And we basically um, helped uh, build out a fridge uh, that is basically a test bed that helps test out these various new materials. And in particular, Google's contribution to this was the dilution refrigerators. We have wired up, uh, we provide the wires and the amplifiers. Uh, we also provided some money for uh, postdocs. Companies like Keysight provided the VNAs. And then together, this, we, we put this project together so that we could improve um, our, uh, we can help the industry as well as help the academic community find better materials for uh, building qubits. So I just like to kind of like do this as a uh, little bit of, um, of a preview of if we were to find a really interesting novel qubit design, how we would take that same approach of uh, helping external academia to uh, build a test bed, as well as try to make sure that the qubit designs that are being made will ultimately help us build a fault-tolerant quantum computer. Um, so with that, I'd just like to kind of like um, thank everybody uh, for this presentation. And I'd like to kind of let uh, you and Lev uh, speak a few couple words as well. Are, are there actually any questions about academic engagements before we finish though? All right, you and Lev, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I would like just to thank all speakers and to say that uh, to say that, well, the goal, apart from bringing all these people interested in this subject, was to is to to establish some collaborate uh, to establish some links between different groups um, because and especially between theorists and experimentalists because the problem is extremely difficult and I do not think that any group can hope to really uh, solve it by itself. Uh, even ours. Uh, so uh, we would like to, uh, to 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 see some useful to see some uh, collaboration in by this meeting and maybe the ones that follow. And uh, so we strongly encourage all, all people to talk uh, in all possible uh, and factorial uh, combinations. Thank you so much for discussions and for presenting your results. Um, so I just give uh, a place to Hartmut who wanted to say the final word. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lev. Um, yeah, I was just asked to uh, say a few uh, closing things. The um, main thing I should say is that um, I want to thank you, um, you Chen and uh, Lev, uh, Alan and Eric for organizing this uh, beautiful workshop and I was really impressed by the attendance. It looked like a who is who of um, uh, engineers and researchers who build uh, novel qubit architectures so in that sense it was very successful. And of course um, connecting to the remark yesterday going forward with in our roadmap is it good enough to just refine our current workhorse, the Transmon qubit, or is it time to have what we call in our group a renegade effort, essentially efforts parallel to the plan of record and um, bite the bullet and take one of the um, various designs we have heard about in the last two days, even though many of them seem rather related to the GKP or the um, zero pi qubit ideas, of course, there are, there's a lot of commonality. So the question from a managerial perspective is, is it time to um, start an effort in earnest to package up one of those ideas or the set of ideas to make it ready for scaling up and be, make it useful in a larger architecture? Of course, a lot of uh, I's needs to be dotted and T's need to be crossed. Um, yeah, hard to say, but it uh, seems encouraging that there is this brewing set of ideas um, possibly um, ready for scaling up and larger integration. So with that, I um, thank you all for attending and uh, yeah, please stay all healthy and we hope to 
greet you in person um, not too long from now and some follow-up events. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll see everyone in the future. Take care. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Be safe. Bye. Bye.